G'day, everybody, and welcome to the Scale Ups podcast this week. Do you know, sometimes I just love this job. Uh, actually, all the time I love this job, but some weeks uh, in some conversations, you just come away from them thinking, that was just magical. Um, my guest today was Brian Will, and he's a serial entrepreneur, founder, and author of The Dropout Millionaire. He, you know, he's 37 lessons on how to succeed in business with no money, no education, and no clue. He's got such an interesting story and ultimately, you know, he, without kind of a formal education, really, he built six companies, he exited three of them uh, and he's still, you know, he's a business leader today. He's got a chain of eight restaurants and he's still going. He's got, he's got all sorts of businesses going. So he's a current entrepreneur. He's not, you know, he's, he's still in the, in the thick of it, right? So he's still got lessons. He's integrating those lessons. And so I asked him a whole bunch of questions today about the biggest turning points in his journey, you know, like surprising lessons that he's learned, the worst advice he's ever received you know how you think about when it when is it time to pivot how do you stay you know motivated when um when the the going stuff how do you think about risk taking how do you sort of protect your downside but still go after growth what are some of the things that people don't think about or don't give credence to that are really important in the mindset of a founder who wants to break out from seven figures into eight figures which i know a lot of our audience are are in those sort of size businesses so i think you're absolutely going to love this conversation i really hope you enjoy it um and uh i wish you all the best make sure you get a pen and write things down because uh he gives you some real gold in this and uh, make sure you listen all the way to the end where he sums up um his advice for you guys um as seven figure founders trying to break through to eight enjoy today Welcome to the Scale Ups Podcast, where each week you get to hear Sean Steele, professional CEO, growth mentor, and advisory board chair, unpack the strategies that successful founders have used to achieve scale in their businesses. Stay tuned as he interviews the entrepreneurs who've made it, learns from industry experts, and follows a group of founders still striving to scale. G'day, everyone, and welcome to the Scale Ups podcast, where we help first-time founders learn the secrets of scaling so they can fulfill the potential of their business, make bigger decisions with greater confidence, and maximize the value and impact they can create in the world. I am your host, Sean Steele, and my guest today is Brian Will, serial entrepreneur, founder, and author of The Dropout Millionaire, 37 Business Lessons on How to Succeed in Business with No Money, No Education, and No Clue. <laughs> How are you, Brian? I'm good. And, and check me if I'm wrong, but you're in Australia. It's morning for you over there. It is morning. Yep. About 8.30 in the morning for me. And you are in Park City, Utah. So I am feeling very jealous because I would rather be on the snow. <laughs> than, <laughs> than in the yeah, heat. It's later in the day here. <laughs> and sadly, you didn't get out on the, um, we were having a quick chat off air and uh, you didn't get out on the slopes today. I'm sorry to hear that, but you have brought with you uh, your Barry Manilow voice. Uh, I did. So, yes, this is. It's either my a day after drinking voice or I'm sick voice. Either one of those, I, I get the whole very, very, very white thing going on. Well, here. we get the benefits, so that's that's good. Uh, that that works for me. Well, look, I've got heaps of questions for you today, um, Brian. You got such an interesting, um, such an interesting background, and so maybe if I can have a crack at your um, the sort of overview of your story, and you can then correct me, fill in gaps. I'm sure I'm going to get things in the wrong order. Um, yeah, let's rock and roll. All right. Well, you grew up in a sort of low income house, household. You found school pretty challenging and ultimately you dropped out of high school, but you found, I guess, entrepreneurship as a way to you know, build a better life uh, for yourself and, and probably for your family. You've created or co-created six successful companies in four different industries over the last 35 odd years. And you early days, you started out like I did <laughs> in a lawn mowing business where all of a sudden you realized um, that you were, the, the owner was probably making a lot more money than you. And so you ended up starting your own business, which you ended up franchising into seven locations. You've yep. sold t-shirts out of your car, which you grew into a successful clothing brand. You started multiple insurance companies, um, a software company, a digital marketing company, a real estate investment firm, and you own a chain currently of uh, eight restaurants. And in terms of exits, you've had you sold three companies to VC or private equity, and out of what out of those three, one of those also then went on to go public. How did I go? Pretty good. You're close. I did. I did. I didn't drop out of high school. I failed out of high school. Oh, you failed away. <laughs> and then I actually got back in, but I graduated with a 1.2 GPA. So I don't. It's pretty much the same thing. Yeah. And, I love uh, that. Yeah, I did yeah. do the military service thing right after that because I got kicked out of the house and. My first landscaping company, that, that is the funny story. I went to work for these guys and I was making four bucks an hour, right? And we were doing about $2,000 a week in this truck. So one day I thought, I'm making $160 and this guy's like making $1,500 and all we're doing is mowing grass. You know, anybody can mow grass. Yeah. So 
I quit and started my own business. And that's how my entrepreneurial journey started. I love that. You know, it's just, and it's so, you know, you don't require any vision to do that, right? You just need to go, hang on a second. This does not make sense. And I know that my, my younger son out of the, the two boys, uh, he's, I can, you know, I can see that the older one is like the super hardworking one, unbelievably diligent, massively responsible, but maybe may not, uh, kind of get annoyed by the fact that somebody's making more than him. Whereas the younger one <laughs> really doesn't want to do the work. Um, but I can, he's always asking questions about shareholders and how boards work and how decisions get made. And I can see he's probably the one, he'll probably have no money for a really long time. And then he'll probably start something. <laughs> That's a future rather... CEO right there. <laughs> totally. Totally. Well, look, um, before I ask you about sort of entrepreneurship and scaling, which I have lots of questions, did I hear correctly on the grapevine that you're planning to go into space next year? How in the world did you hear that? That is true. So, but, so there's a play, there's a company called space perspective which right. is different than say the, the you know, Elon's uh, company or Bezos company or Branson's mm -hmm. company, I guess. Yeah. Um, space perspective takes you up in a balloon, not oh, wow. unlike the ones that keep getting shot down over America <laughs> right now. So I, I've got to tell you, I may be a bit worried, a bit nervous. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, we go to a hundred thousand feet in a balloon. It's like an air conditioned, you wow. know, it's got TVs, Wi-Fi. you can stream from up there. It's got a full bar. I mean, you can, it's a oh six hour Lord. journey. Um, and it's going to be super amazing. fun. A hundred thousand feet in a balloon. Crikey. For a hundred thousand dollars, which is much cheaper than everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's um, what, why, what, what, what made that come about? You know, I have always, since I, since I started making some money, Sean, I have tried to do, I call it chasing your passions, right? Mm -hmm. Everything that everybody always says they're going to do, but nobody ever actually does. Yeah. And so when we sold the companies in 06 and 08, I became a pilot, a dive master. I climbed mountains. I signed up for a space tour. I mean, pretty much I ran with the bulls in, in Spain. I walked the Great Wall of China. I was, dove with great white sharks in Africa. Just every, you know, I don't want to die and think, crap, I forgot to do that. So I'm trying to do everything okay. you can possibly imagine. I love that. You know, I don't know if you've read the book, um, Die With Zero, but that is 100% that philosophy. That's like, Stop trying to like hoard all this money for some future date where you think just in case I might need that extra, right. you know, I might need that million dollars in the bank. It's like, well, if you die with all that money, like think about how much earlier you could have stopped working and just been enjoying yourself and doing all the things. You don't know when you're going to, when you're going to cark it. So why not, um, you know, make the most of it? Yeah. I share your, I share your philosophy. Uh, absolutely. Um, so thank you very, uh, thanks for that. I, I'm interested in if we, if we had to kind of reflect back on the past, cause you've, you've built a lot of companies, right? What was the biggest turning point? in your journey that really shaped your approach to business after that? Is there something that stands out for you? Oh yeah, this one's easy. And remembering I came from a rough household and I was an angry young man and failed out of high school and had a giant chip on my shoulder. And when I went into business, I had an ego problem, even though it was, you know, <laughs> un, uh, I didn't, didn't deserve to have one. I, I always laugh at people who have <laughs> ego problems and they have no right to have an ego, quite yeah. frankly. But, and so for a lot of years, the old adage that when you're a hammer, everything's a nail. I was a hammer and I just beat people up. My employees, I was not a nice guy and never really hit it big until I met my mentor, Steve. And there was a turning point and there's a whole story behind this where I almost quit one day and he walked in my office and he said, look, you can leave right now if you want. You, I'll, I'll give me my equity back. You don't, you owe nothing. We had borrowed like a half a million. He goes, we're going to walk away as friends, but we can't ever have this conversation again. I don't want to hear any doubt. I don't want to hear any, you know, arguments or, or anything. And, and I, and I sat there looking at him and I'm shorting the story up, but I finally looked at him and I said, all right, Steve. And he had been very successful in life and I wasn't, I said, all right, Steve, I'm in whatever you say I'm going to do. And it was the first point in business for me that I started listening to somebody else hmm. and letting him and just watching the way he treated people and the way he worked in business and everything he did. And, interesting story we we hadn't done a dollar in revenue for nine months and the very next month after that conversation we hit our first deal on the internet and we did like six million that year 13 the next 30 the next and 60 the next sold the company for 80 million dollars and i literally it scares me to death to think that if i could have literally said i'm out instead of i'm in and my life would be completely different than it is today yeah and, and really the, the lesson there is sometimes you need to let other people lead and you need to listen and, and get your ego out of it. And that's what I had to do. And that's what I learned. 
Oh, I love hearing you say that. I mean, that is such the philosophy of the kinds of founders that I work with. You know, the, the kinds of people that are listening to this today are usually founders who are their first time founders. Their businesses are doing well, right? You know, they're probably mm-hmm. maybe they're, they're in seven figures. They maybe haven't they broken through to eight, but they also they're really conscious of the fact they don't know what they don't know, and they're open minded <laughs> and they're looking for answers. They're not thinking I've I've got this now. I've already got to three mil. I'm definitely going to take us to twenty. It's like no, no. They know that they don't know how to get there. And That's so interesting that you say it. you're working with those folks because I. I, that's rare. If, if everyone you're dealing with is is got their ego in check, that's that's really a really really good thing. I don't find that a lot. In, in yeah, right. Industry. Okay, I think, and probably also because I spend most of my time with um, services founders, and they're not tech founders, so they're not typically focused on a big exit with huge multiples mm-hmm. of revenue and so on. They're like, no, no, I just need to build a sustainable business, and if it goes well, at some point somebody will want to buy it, and so that's right. Of, a little more incremental, maybe than so you know rapid, super hardcore capital raising sort of uh, kind yeah. of path. What about? Um, Sometimes we get lessons from really unexpected sources. What's the most surprising lesson you've learned from a place that you didn't expect to get it from? Uh, my personal assistant. Th- this is a funny story. A couple of years ago, and even today, when I start down a path, I, I'm like an A personality. I'm ADHD. I'm very driven. I like, and I get short with people. And I'm just like, yes, no, yes, do this, do this, do this, do this. And one day she came to me and she said, if you don't start being nice to me, I'm going to quit. And I was like, I might not be nice to you. She goes, no, you're short with me. I'm afraid to call you on the phone. And I don't want to work for you if that's the way you're going to be. And I was like, crap. All right. I apologize. I'm sorry. Like I had to apologize for five minutes to keep her from quitting because I really needed her. And, uh, and since then, I, I, I kind of try to watch myself very closely that I'm being, you know, a nice guy to work for and not just a driven entrepreneur. Mm. Such an interesting lesson in humility, uh, isn't yes. it? Like, yeah, you know, we may have the we may have the immediate. You know, I always found my 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 HR director was great at kind of pushing me on that. She's like, "Hey, Sean, like, I know that you can see where we need to go, exactly how to get there, what every single person needs to do, but everybody's not on that journey yet. And if you yes. don't come back and like meet people where they are, and then think about leading them there, then there is no journey, right? Like, no one's following 100%. you. Forget about it. Well, that yeah. kind of leads into a question about team. Like, you know, one of the biggest challenges for founders is figure out especially if you're trying to break through to seven to eight like it's really about team right you know you, you can no longer do all the stuff yourself you can't be the smartest person in the room you've got to really build some leadership capability in your business how do you what's the most important lesson you've learned about building a successful team and how do you go about um, identifying and recruiting the right people into your organizations identifying recruiting is always hard as you know because yeah. i find a lot of people in the in, here in the u.s we call it resume hopping mm-hmm. right they jump from a director to a VP and six months later, they're trying to get the next one up. And the reality yeah. is they were never qualified for the VP in the first place, <laughs> That's right? right? This is resume hopping. Yeah. So it's always tough. But one of the things I have, when I work with folks, one of the things I have always told them is if you're going to bring people in, you need to allow them to fail and learn so that they can be good at what they're doing moving forward. If you don't allow people to fail and then you go in and you take over for them and, and do their job then you're always going to have this person didn't learn how to do what they did. And you're always as a founder or a CEO going to be working a hundred hours a week. So you got to let people learn to do their job. You got to let them fail without getting upset because if they learn, then they're a much better person. It might've cost you a little bit of money or time, but you now have a much, much better employee. So that, that's, that's what I always tell people. Mm, that's interesting. Do you, when you're looking for good leaders, do you, uh, tend to run the kind of traditional process of, you know, putting up a job ad and seeing what comes in, or do you proactively go and sort of tap people in the industry that you, I mean, obviously when you've been in business for a long time, right, you, you build quite a big network. And so you yeah. probably think people from previous businesses big network, get yeah. that person from over there. Is that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Work the network. Yeah. What's the worst business advice <laughs> you've ever received? Well, this goes back to what I said a minute ago. And in fact, I, I was weirdly enough, I told you I was on a podcast in the UK this morning and, and the podcast host was like, yeah, you really need to learn everything about everything that's going on in your company. And my answer to that is, no, you don't. I don't have time as a CEO to understand how everything works. I got to be at 30,000 feet. I got to be looking down all across the organization and guiding people and doing strategic direction. If I got to be down there figuring out how to do your job, then once again, I'm back to working 100, 150 hours a week. And I just don't have time to do that. So yeah, I don't think you need to know everything. I think you need to know how to do your job and understand finance because that's critical to every business. But yeah, you don't need to know everything about everything. Mm. I always feel like the sort of role of the CEO is to like know enough to be able to challenge people's thinking and maybe yes. you know hold them to account or sort of 
know when you're being taken for a ride, but never to get beyond <laughs> that. You know, like that's their job to get beyond that. But you've just got to be know enough to be a little bit dangerous, but uh, don't fool yourself into thinking you actually know how to do it because you don't. And, <laughs> and really, the way to do that is just to ask questions. Because if you ask questions over and over, people will reveal themselves mm. whether they are trying to pull the wool over your eyes. So. Mm. It's about, I've always said success is about, not about it having the answers, it's about knowing how to ask the questions. Jack, well, Welch, like Jack Welch, one of the most prolific leaders in, in the United States, was huge on asking questions. He would just walk around GE asking people questions. He mm -hmm. didn't have answers. He just talked to people and asked them questions, and <laughs> he was a great leader. I think there's probably a new name for that now, Brian, which is like prompt engineering, because you, know, you see people using chat GPT and asking like, the first level question and going, oh, I've got an answer, move on. It's like, no, 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 that's not how this works. You need to follow up the question, ask a better question. Now ask a deeper yes. question. Now ask a deeper question. It's actually yep. about the prompt engineering, if you like. It's got a new term, but it's the same stuff we've been doing Keep for a while. Keep asking questions. Keep asking. Okay. I like that. So no, look, you're still, um, you're still running businesses now. It's not like you're done. And so I'm interested in how you think about running your current ones. How do you know when it's time to pivot or make a change in direction in your business? And what advice would you give somebody who's facing that decision at the moment? You know, I, I actually do a speech called time travel and your magic crystal ball. Okay. <laughs> and basically what that says is that as a CEO or an entrepreneur, you need to be able to look ahead into the future and see what's going to happen in your business. And the way you do that is what we call uh, trend following or or historical analysis of P&Ls, right? So if I have a 24 month P&L and I can go backwards in time and and track every single line item in a P&L from, you know, top line to bottom line and everything in between, I bring it up to today and if I go through and look at the trend analysis on every one of those lines, if nothing changes, I can pretty much predict what's going to happen in the next 12 months, mm -hmm. right? So if I see a downward trend, at that point I need to be able to improvise and adapt as we say and make a change or you're going to continue down the path that you're on which might not be the way you want to go i always talk about you know apple computer they started building motherboards and then somewhere along the line jobs is like hey man we should put music on an ipod and the next thing you know we have an iphone and every bit of information known to mankind is now at your fingertips that's astounding change mm -hmm. ibm started building typewriters and today they're, you know, whatever the heck IBM does. So mm -hmm. you have to look at your business. You have to look at the future. You have to look at the business you're in is going to be sustainable. And if it's not, then you need to improvise and adapt and change. So mm -hmm. to me, it's always about looking backwards up to today and, and then figuring out if what you're doing is, is really the future. But look, I'll, I'll give you an example. I was on another podcast yesterday and I won't say any names, but these guys are harvesting rainwater for drinking water which sounds like an, an amazing thing to do, but they're selling it for $2.50 a bottle when I can go down to the local grocery store and buy it for 10 cents. And I know it's a great idea and it's probably better for the environment, but nobody's going to buy your $2.50 bottle of water. If I can buy it for 10 cents. Yeah. If you can buy it for 10 cents. Yeah. Like wh why would you do that unless you're just yeah. hardcore green? Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with that. But the business model is not going to be sustainable because the general public isn't going to buy it in enough volume for you to make money. And that's, mm. you know, they might need to figure out another thing to do there. Mm. It's interesting, isn't it? It's like when you think about strategy, I always think that, because uh, this is an interesting um, point that you brought up, like number one is looking back to the past and seeing like, what is the past telling me about what, what's likely to happen in the future? And then the second mm -hmm. part of that, as you said, around your crystal ball is to go, out into the future and actually you know, remember that your job as the CEO is you're the only person that's actually going to be spending time thinking about what's coming in the next three years, what things are going to affect our industry, what new technologies are going on, what are competitors doing, blah, blah, blah. And you actually have to craft some kind of a path through that. It doesn't mean that you know what it is, mm -hmm. but you have to be able to make some decisions about where you think it's going to go to help the business not just focus on like incremental optimization of today. Because sometimes if you're so head down on incremental optimization of today, you miss some of the step changes you might need to make or, yep. you know, all the, you know, to your point, they were making motherboards all of a sudden they had this idea around music. Like if they weren't thinking broadly enough, they wouldn't have been thinking about how people are going to use these in the future. Right. And those opportunities don't come up. Here's a good one. I'll, I'll give you another one. I was just out in at SpaceX, uh, out in California, mm -hmm. Elon Musk again. And also the boring company is, is headquartered out there. And I'm on city council in my hometown here. So we went out there and went to visit the boring company. And they're digging these giant long tunnels, you know, underneath Las Vegas and in Fort Lauderdale. And 
we come up with an idea in our city, we're trying to bore a tunnel underneath a six lane highway for a walkway for the city. And the clo- and the, the cheapest uh, pricing we have gotten as a city is $8 million to do this. Well, in talking to the boring company, they said, we could do that for $3 million. And we were like, holy crap. Have you ever done that before? They said, no, but it'd be very easy. And I'm, I said, this is a whole new division for the boring company. So we're right now working on getting them out to Alpharetta, Georgia, to bore under a six-lane highway for us so that we can have a tunnel for people to walk. And who knows, this could be a whole new pl- direction for the boring company and Elon Musk mm. company to go. But, yeah. you know, things happen, you change. That's it. Yeah. Can't get too wedded to what you think it's going to be. You still have to have your mind open to what, you know, what's possible, which you don't, you don't know when that's going to come up, right? Well, thinking about that then, sometimes you also have, it's the balance of being able to adapt and change, but also um, sometimes to be able to stay motivated and focused on something that's longer term. How do you make sure that what, what habits do you use or what strategies do you have to, to not lose sight of your vision that you might have for your business and sometimes avoid burnout along the way? Because sometimes the grind's just super hard, right? Uh, what, do you, what do you do? You know, I, this the burnout question, I love the burnout question. And I heard somebody else say this. I'm not going to take credit for it. But when you started your company, did you start your company so that you could work 100 hours a week, miss your family, miss your kids' performances and not be home? And I would say 90% of the time, the answer is no. So the reason you started your company was to build a better lifestyle for yourself and make money. And yet all these entrepreneurs get in there and they think they have to do it all and be everything and everywhere and work 24 hours a day. And that's where the burnout comes from because they've forgotten why they did this. We don't build these companies to kill ourselves. We build them to create a better lifestyle. So you've yeah. got to focus on the end goal, the end result, and what you're really trying to accomplish. And maybe back it off a little bit and enjoy, you know, the fruits of, of what you've done mm. um, and quit trying to just, you know, rock it up to a billion dollars in sales right now. Look, yeah, I, I did that. This is why I'm telling you I did it. And I, I, I wasn't there for my family enough. It ended up getting a divorce for me. Uh, because I worked, as I like to say, dark to dark seven days a week. That's all I did. And yeah. looking back now, yes, I've achieved success, but was it really worth it? Mm. And I'm not that, sure it was. I could have done it different. Question. Yeah, isn't it? It's like you think about, because I've, I've met a lot of founders in my time, you know, I've been in lots of the, you know, YPOs and EOs and uh, sorts of you know, CEO clubs, if you like. And I often meet founders who I'm thinking, I hear you say that you're doing this for your family. Mm. yet have you asked your family what they want they just exactly. want time with you they don't want they like they couldn't care less whether you make yes. a dollar or five thousand dollars as long as you're happy living in a caravan is your kind of your worst case outcome they would rather have access to you than you make you like you you get so excited you're like no no i'm doing this for the family I'm doing this for the family and then seven years later you have a big exit you got a huge and you turn around and you're like oh where's the family oh they it left was, like few it years was right ago. after my exit that we got divorced and i'll tell you another thing it affected my daughter to the point where she doesn't care about money doesn't want to make money wow she works for the salvation army she works in nonprofit. she could mm-hmm. double her income in corporate america tomorrow but to her the money represented daddy being gone Pain. yeah and she didn't like it wow wow that's a that's a tough lesson hey what um can i ask how you think about risk taking in your business like how um i've got a i've got a friend who i just love the way you know i'm i'm typically pretty um i don't know what the what right word is pro risk like taking bets like i i'll happily take risk on i'm not a super skeptical think about all the possible consequences kind of guy i had a, a good colleague who's a great entrepreneur and every time we have a conversation about a deal he's making or a new business he's creating it's always about and this is how i protected my downside it's always trying to ring fence his risk <laughs> how do you think about risk taking and how do you sort of um still pursue growth but minimize your downside how do you think about that I, i'm more like your friend i gotta be honest but right? okay. i do it from a, i do it from um a point of asking questions. So if we're going to start down a new road or start a new business, the first thing we do is we start asking every single possible question we can ask. I play devil's advocate on everything. You think it's great. I will come up with five reasons why it's not. You think this is going to work. I'll come up with five reasons why it's not. Not because I'm trying to be negative. Yeah. It's because I'm trying to protect my downside because I want to be prepared. If you tell me we have a risk of X, fine. How would we possibly get around X if, and when that happens? Mm -hmm. And it's much like it's, it's weird, but I don't know how you are, but like if I'm about to go in and have a, a sales presentation, I practice my presentation. If I'm about to have to go fire somebody, I practice what I'm going to say. If I'm about to argue with my spouse, I go practice what I'm going to say. Mm-hmm. I do that because I want to be prepared for whatever's going to come at me so I'm not surprised, right? Yeah. And that's the way I look at business as well. I got to 
ask a thousand questions and find out every possible thing that can go wrong. It doesn't mean I'm not going to do it. It just means mm. I'm going to prepare myself. So when that happens, I can go, oh yeah, okay, we got it. We got an answer for that. Yeah. And I can react quickly to what's yeah. ever, whatever is happening to me. Wow. That's so interesting. Like I am, anyone who knows me, who always worked with me in the time will say, you've never met anybody more prepared than Sean Steele. Most detailed <laughs> notes, most prepared. Like if there's every, every town hall, every, you know, major presentation, every, you know, every client meeting, like I am unbelievably prepared. And yet when it comes to taking risks, I don't naturally go to think of all the possible consequences and all the things that could go wrong, which is really interesting. But so what I do is I rely on one of my closest friends who is exactly wired like that. I'm like, Hey, I think I could do this and I'd like it to look like this. Tell me all the reasons this is not going to work. And he is yes. just so good at it. So I'm, I recognize it's a real you know gap of mine. And so <laughs> I have to bring people around to kind of fill that. Um, cause it, I just know it's not in my nature. Um, that's to, just super key though. At least you're, at least you're reaching out and looking for somebody to play that role for you so that you will be prepared. Look, it's willing. Taking risk is not that big a deal if you're prepared for the risk that you're taking. True. Taking silly risks are, 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 are not, I mean, I, that's crazy. I don't take silly yeah. risks. One of my mentors uh, is one of the first guys I worked for and I followed around for years. Um, and he always said just in his own private investments, he said, well, like, I don't ever risk any more than sort of, you know, 10, 15. Like I need to know that I would, even if I made $5 million tomorrow, I would still only risk 10 to 15% of that in the next venture. I would never risk the whole thing and go, oh, if I put all that in, then I could get that, you know, it could be 10 times. He's like, I don't think that way. I just always, I'm well, always then protecting that downside by thinking about My that. personal risk, uh, threshold is that I will risk my income and not my assets. Uh -huh. Right. So I okay. have a pretty high income today and I will risk yeah. every dollar of it. If I make a million and a half dollars this year, I'll invest a million and a half dollars. I'm mm -hmm. just not going to touch my assets. I'm not mm -hmm. touching my stock, not touching my cash, not touching my real estate. I'll risk my income because I know it's going to come in again next year. So that, yeah. that risk doesn't bother me. Uh, I like that. Yeah. It's a really, it's a really interesting psychology. What do you think are some of the unappreciated um, or sort of not, not talked about um, skills or traits that help people really succeed in entrepreneurship? I think the biggest one that I try to tell uh, entrepreneurs is on the financial side. You mm. really, really, really got to know your numbers. You don't have to be the person in there being the CFO or, or counting the dollars, but you really need to understand the numbers in your organization. And this is not even for young entrepreneurs. I've done consulting for Fortune 500 companies. And the people that run those things don't understand the numbers. It fascinates me. Oh, yeah. And you, you give them a simple formula on how to, to I call it bottom-up P&L, right? Mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't look at organizations from a top down. We look at it from the bottom up. Because if I can fix a P&L, and I call every individual salesperson an individual P&L, right? Because every organization has to sell something. So your salespeople have a P&L. It's mm -hmm. fixed OPEX. It's variable offset, OPEX. It's mm -hmm. cost of marketing and what they're paid and whether they generate a profit. And it's fascinating for people to go, oh, I've never thought of that. Mm -hmm. I'm always like, yeah, more people does not equal more profit. Mm -hmm. More revenue does not equal more profit. Yeah. Profit starts at the bottom of the organization and works its way up. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I can tell you every organization, a sales organization I've gone into, we end up firing 20, 25% of the sales staff and revenue never takes a hit. Yeah. Because I take yeah. the lead generation and marketing and I throw it over to the people that are actually producing. They're actually good at it. Yeah. <laughs> they make more money. The organization makes more money with less overhead. I can give you example after example of how I do this. Yeah. And it's really about building that bottom up PL marketing that we then go in and say, okay, Joe, mm. I know I know you think you're selling, but you're actually losing money for the organization. So you either need to correct or I don't know what to tell you. So it's understanding the financials. Yeah. I completely agree. And if you've never, you know, and if you've grown up in an environment where you've just never been exposed to it, then you better find yourself a good, you know, virtual exactly. CFO to, you know, to kind of help learn to, to learn from and go, Hey, unpack this thing for me. Tell me yes. how I should be thinking about this. Ask me really hard questions so I can get better understanding. Like I, to your point, you know, my first executive role where I probably had a, I don't know, $70 million budget or something. I, I, I didn't know I had to read balance sheet whatsoever. Like I'd seen, you know, I'd, I'd looked at P&Ls, but primarily from a sales perspective, because I'd grown up in sales and so I didn't, right. I didn't understand the rest of it uh, really. So I had to go and take myself to, you know, post-grad school and do corporate finance and all that stuff to actually get my head around it and then lean on my peers, you know, CFOs and um, management accountants and stuff to improve my understanding of it. And uh, always, always still learning uh, big time. It's a critical um, skill set. And I think, you know, one other point on that is I see so many founders um, do these kind of top level 
budgeting. Uh, like, I don't know, I've, I've been trained to, to make everything a bottom up budget, right? It's like, if you're going to build your budget for next year, you start from the, you, you start from the assumptions that we spend no money on anything right. and you sort of re-justify everything. Think about that supplier. Is that the right cost base? You know, would we actually still need that thing? Like, mm-hmm. don't just assume because it was there last year, you should add 5% uh, or 10% or whatever the number is and just do a really lazy budget. Like that helps you understand your numbers um, yep. from the bottom up if you kind of zero base budget it. 100%. You're right. Looking ahead, Brian, what are your goals and aspirations for both for your business, but also for your personal life? And what do you think you're going to have to prioritize to achieve those? You know, I've done so many different careers. I call this my, I'm on my seventh career today, um, <laughs> from landscaping to insurance, to technology, to restaurants. And um, I've been, and, and I talk about in my book, the difference between being self-employed and being a business owner. Most of your people, if not all of your people here are business owners, they're building something that has intrinsic value, that has a potential exit at the end of the day. But with that comes, you know, a lot of the headaches of business. I have 150 employees today and I just got sued by the EEOC again for something that some employee did to another employee that I've never met. And now the EEOC is coming after me. And, you know, after a while that, that starts to grind on me. So Honestly, my personal future is I'm looking to sell the restaurant chain, the real estate I'm keeping because it's all passive income, mm-hmm. and I am shifting my, my we'll call it my my career goals or my next career into working with young. Uh, we call it well funded startups to ten million in revenue. Okay, that are looking for mentoring and not coaching. Right, I'm not here to, mm-hmm. to do the fluffy stuff, and I'm here to say, look, this is the deal. This is how it works. And this is what you need to do. So. That's kind of my next, uh, that's my next big push is moving into the mentoring role for, for these entrepreneurs because I've got enough experience that we can bring down to these guys and, and help them, like you've said in the past, go from seven to eight figures, right? Yeah. And beyond, so to speak. Yeah. Nice. Well, I'm excited to follow along and see how that, um, how that plays out, Brian. I'm sure you and I have got lots of opportunities to chat, uh, given we're you know, kind of in a, in a similar space. I've got one last question for you, and I'm thinking about if you were to take a long look back and look at all of your successes, but also all your failures um, as an entrepreneur. What founders, what advice you'd give to founders, I should say, um, who are going well, who are in seven figures, but who really want to, who are struggling to kind of make that transition to eight and beyond, which does require a sort of step change in the way that mm-hmm. you think about your business. What advice would you give them? You said it earlier, uh, Sean, and, and it's very fortunate that apparently the folks that you're working with understand that they don't know how to get to that next level. And so, and I, I have a key phrase in my book. I say, stop chasing the advice of billionaires, right? Because billionaires can't help you. I use the example of if you own a trucking company and you're moving product between LA and San Francisco and your people keep getting stuck in traffic every day, you're going to have to figure out a new way to move it, you know, at night or in off hours or whatever. That's how you're going to figure it out. Elon Musk, when he got stuck in traffic between LA and San Francisco, he said, screw this. I'm going to build a tunnel underground. Okay. He thinks differently. Mm. We can't do that. His yeah. advice isn't going to help you. Mm. So I tell people, if you need to get to that next level, you need to find that person that has done that. And they've taken it from seven to eight or even eight to nine, mm. who's 10 steps ahead of you, not a thousand steps, yeah. who has recent relevant experience and how to get there and just say, look, man, get on my board of advisors, get on my board of directors and come in here and talk me through this because you figured out the key to get there and I don't know what it is yet. So check your ego, yeah. find that person that can help you and then listen to them. I love that. And you know, that is, um, when I first decided to you know, build this podcast and of course blank canvas, right? It's like, well, who, who do I really want to bring on this podcast? And I was very deliberate and have continued to be deliberate to not go after people and uh, not, you know, go after founders who have, who are like 500 million, a billion, multiple billions, just because mm-hmm. of the notoriety and the celebrity. And it's like, that is not helpful to a seven figure no. founder. Uh, to your point, no. maybe that's a bit of inspiring, but it's not practical and I want people right. to have practical advice. And therefore that's why the founders who succeeded are in the, usually in uh, you know, uh, high eights or nine figure um, businesses. But um, yeah, they, they, are, they are close enough and recent enough to having done the thing to be able to explain how they did the thing. Uh, and it's amazing and, how they'll go, look, I tried that. It didn't work. This is what I did. If you'll do exactly what I'm telling you here, yeah. it will work for you too. And then you go, holy crap, I never thought of that. And then now you've, yeah. you've moved. But Here's the thing: you got these entrepreneurs got to get their egos in check, and you're telling me the folks you work with do, but they got to get their ego in check and be willing to take that advice and listen. Because mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. we're all hard driving, red A personality. We think mm-hmm. we're right all the time. We make f- fast decisions, and you yeah. know you got to get that thing in check and, and let somebody come in and, and 
do what they do best and help you. I love that, Brian. I've been uh, really grateful for your um, time today, but also I'd just like, like to acknowledge the way that you've built these businesses because what I feel from you is this really, um, th- this success has come off the blend of humility and courage, you know, the ability to um, you know, to take risks, but also the, the ability to learn and open your mind to the fact that maybe you don't know everything and that you've you had to kind of constantly learn from others uh, along the way. And I love that you're making that transition in life to be able to go, okay, now how do I codify this and help other people um, do it because you know how life-changing it can be. And that doesn't necessarily mean it has to be, finan- yes, it could be financially life-changing, but all to your point, like if you're able to get out of working 100 hours a week and never seeing your family and get back to something that's reasonable, um, that is life-changing. Uh, and that if you is. can help somebody do that, that's that's unbelievably rewarding. It's one of the things I love most about um, what I get to do. How would, um, Brian, if people wanted to sort of follow along with your journey, hear what you're doing in the future of mentoring, like where would you direct them to? Yeah, go to my website. It's www.brianwillmedia.com, brianwillmedia.com. And my podcast show's on there. My books are on there. All, everything's on there. So that's easy. Beautiful. Uh, folks, if you've enjoyed today, uh, we, of course, really appreciate it. If you subscribe, leave us a review or share Brian's uh, episode with someone that you know uh, who'd love it. We would, I'm sure he and I uh, would greatly appreciate it. It just gets his wisdom into the hands of more people. And if you'd actually like to learn about how to build a kick-ass growth strategy for your business, then you are in luck because uh, after creating 100 million bucks in revenue in for four companies over eight years with myself and my team, uh, I'm now starting to, I'm, you know, I'm putting together those lessons to share with seven figure founders trying to break through to eight and beyond uh, in my inaugural uh, Scale Ups Roadmap course. And the doors open in early May for the very first time. And they're only going to open three times a year. So if you want to find all of, uh, out all about it, just go to scaleupsroadmap.com.au, pop your name on the wait list, and we will share with you all the details. Uh, as they come available. But please join me in thanking Brian Wills. Uh, Really grateful for your time, Brian. You've been listening to the Scalots Podcast. I'm Sean Steele, and I will chat to you all next week. Thanks again, Brian. Thank you. G'day, everyone. Just a couple of quick things before you go. If you have questions that you'd love myself or an upcoming guest to tackle about challenges that you're facing in scaling your business, please just jump straight on the website, scaleupspodcast.com. You can record your message straight from your mobile by hitting the button on the right-hand side of the page, or you can just email them the old-fashioned way, questions at scaleupspodcast.com. And just a quick reminder, nothing we spoke about today constitutes financial or business advice. If you are considering making big decisions in your business, seek out a professional who can look at your situation in detail and make sure you're getting sound, personalized advice. Thanks for listening. Look forward to being back in your podcast feed next week.